Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Next in Time podcast. I'm your host, S.T. Tangarala, and today our guest is none other than Edward Laganis. If you want to know more about Edward Laganis, he is the co-founder and CEO of Window, who has many years of experience working in the product design and construction space. He's looking to make a major impact in bringing the, the rest of the world to the construction site, like bringing people to the construction site. He was formerly a startup advisor for NYU and an advisory board member across multiple startups. And Window is his current startup, Window, is a social media platform that is looking to democratize construction where people can share what they're building, learning, and showcasing throughout the construction process. He his startup window is the winner of the Silicon Valley Entrepreneurs Pitch and Demo event for construction tech that took place uh, earlier last month. And so he is looking to now share his mission and vision of what he's trying to do. So, Ed, welcome to the show. Thank you, Esty. Thanks for having me. So is it true? Well, I just want to just say congratulations on winning that uh, pitch uh, pitch and demo event, because, uh, you know, if you recall, like I was there, you were there and there was like four or five other startups that were just giving some of the most exquisite presentations out there. And you were able to... Um, impress the investors so much that they're willing to give you a chance on, you know, going forward. So how does that feel? Uh, it felt good. It was, um, you know, it sort of validates what, you know, both my co-founders and I had already known about this space is that, you know, you can throw technology at a lot of things these days, you know, from AR, VR, um, machine learning. But at the end of the day, we're not really doing much to solve the problem of people. Um, robots are not going to be taken over for people in the next 10 years. And we still have a lot of housing and a lot of buildings to build. So, you know, that's my focus. Yeah. Cause people are, I mean, regardless of whatever happens in the coming years or even centuries, even, I think people will still want that authentic human connection in a way. Right. Yeah. It's not just the connection to the other workers, but even that skill there's, you know, you can definitely automate monotonous processes. Um, but between that, there are, a lot of hard skills that you need and you know custom homes aren't going away anytime soon and so i felt that you know there is a disconnect in the world today to finding such skilled talent even with all the digit digitation and and mobile platforms we have finding great talent isn't easy yeah because is it true that um construction is one of the slowest industries to really involve to really evolve to the next stage in a way is that true or is like because you know, I've, see, I've seen somewhere I, that yeah it's a lot of uh, there's a lot of stories out there that uh you know there's startups that evolve every half year to a year but construction in general in order to evolve it takes around 60 plus years for the evolution to take place yeah there hasn't been a ton of innovation in the construction industry for quite some time uh one of my co-founders who owns a steel business likes to say the last innovation um, in major innovation in the construction industry was the hydraulic crane, <laughs> which <laughs> really improved the amount of leverage and uh, the ability to stack things high. Right. So, right. you know, we have all this technology, but you can't just force feed it to this industry that is set in their ways and has a very particular way of doing things. Um, you got to come at it from the owner's approach, from the people taking the risk, the people who have the experience. Um, you you got to tread lightly into this space because, um, you know, technology is not something they're easily going to uh, accept unless you can easily um, show that it's going to save them a ton of money and a ton of time. Yeah, that makes sense. So are you currently in, you're based off of New York or Chicago? Because the last one we spoke, it was your based, I'm trying to figure out where, I forget. Brooklyn, where New York. <laughs> Yeah, Brooklyn. I presume that there's a lot of heat construction going on in that area, in that part of the yeah. Country. There's a there's a significant amount of construction going on in New York City, in and in the outer boroughs where we are in Brooklyn. And I think you know it's both addressing multi-use um, and also housing shortages. Right? Um, there's you know we're seeing more and more people go go back to the office. The office is changing its you know its layout, its environment to adapt to hybrid. Um, you have people who are trying to move back into the city. Rents are the highest they've ever been. So all those people that locked in those deals during COVID, like, good job. Uh, but <laughs> for, you know, 
it, it, it's giving you more justification to build even more housing, even build even higher and uh, creating challenges, um, trying to get that done on in reasonable timelines. Got it. Yeah, because I hear that there has been a major influx of people who wanted to move to New York again and then be able to enjoy that city life. That's why if you yeah, I think probably that's why rents have been just skyrocketing. And now the importance of in order to keep the rents stable, I think it's that requires more construction in a way. Just more housing. Yeah. I mean, whether it's, you know, revamping an existing project, um, you know, clearing the way for something uh, taller, low income housing, every component of construction that is meant towards getting more people into tighter spaces um, is going to help, you know, keep those rent prices from going any higher. I don't think they'll go down unless there's another pandemic, but I, I really think that like to keep them from going up again is you just got to provide more housing. Yeah. And that's what I see a lot of developers doing these days. Yeah, that makes sense. So yeah, let's get back to your background, because I think you were originally a, uh, you, you were you were just product designer and who worked worked in a construction firm and also a startup advisor for NYU. Could you tell me more about those uh, experiences? Yeah, so I, my background is in uh, mechanical engineering, and so um, you know I've always been sort of that technically minded individual. But I did study architecture before I finished my degree in engineering, um, and for me, it was you know, the fear of not getting a job in uh, architecture or getting a very low paying job or inter internship in architecture and not having a means of paying off my student loans. So I quickly got into engineering, which led me to product design, which led me to human centered product design, which is focusing around unmet needs and the people. Um, and it became really the great a great foundation for studying the problems of my co-founders and you know why it's so hard for them to find workers and where do they find them and how do we get them onto a platform to find them so it became um really the core foundation of what windows is about which is really about the people who work in construction and getting them uh elevating them and and showing their work and getting them to a level where you know not only are they going to be proud of their work but their work is actually going to help them get them a better job or it's going to help them educate uh entry level workers it's going yeah. to show you how something's built so um, yeah it's kind of why i joined yeah but that makes sense so when you began i think we can uh talk more about window in a bit but before we do that let's um get to know more about what like what but let's get to know more about ed like what made you become more interested in the world of construction even even studying mechanical engineering in college um well i grew up <laughs> i grew up in something called section eight housing right which right. is subsidized housing um in a lower income building uh neighborhood in which you know my parents didn't uh didn't have a lot of money my, my and when my mom when my parents divorced it was just my mom raising us my me and my older brother you know, we lived in a pretty decrepit apartment, um, you know, peeling plaster, leaky ceilings, um, doors that wouldn't close. And I always, I, at a very early age, you know, my 12th birthday present was a power drill. Um, mm -hmm. And I just got into like fixing things, right? And it was, my mother used to call it, uh, you know, I have golden hands, right? I could fix anything. And I, I took that skill um, with me into, you know, a ton of other things from building cars and motorcycles. Eventually, the first apartment I ever owned when I graduated college, I renovated. Um, and I always been interested in construction. And during the summers, while, you know, to help pay for college, I worked for uh, my friend's parents. Um, my friends growing up, their parents were in the trades. One of them owned a general, one was the general contractor, did a lot of framing and I worked for him. And then another one was a plumber. And I spent my summers just, you know, for cash, helping them out to try to pay the bills. And I just always loved the idea that at the end of the day, they go home at night and realize they built someone's home. They improved someone's house. Yeah. It, was, it felt very rewarding. Um, yeah. Even it's incredibly hard work. Yeah, I was going to say, I see a lot of construction workers out there in my in my own neighborhood. Like well, when they built, you know, they work day and night building that one house right next to my, let's say, in my neighborhood. And by the time they finish building it, I can say I can see the glee in their eyes, their sense of pride that like they finally built something so magnanimous. 
And I always see that as something like, okay, these, I, that's how I was able to really understand some construction people, how they think, because, you know, when you're, when you're handy, when you're working in the blazing heat, especially during summertime, working in the blazing heat or, bla or blazing cold during the winter, um, you know, when you're, tr when they're trying to build a house, it takes a lot of energy and move and a lot of body work to be able to move material, you know, fix, all, assemble all the material together and build it all, all the way, all the way to a completely furnished and finished house that I can tell, like, by the time they finished building that, they could just feel like they want to go celebrate. They, they felt like they just entered, uh, they just stepped onto the moon for the first time, like that level of elation that I can see from them. <laughs> So, I, I, I think what you're seeing is also like, thank God this one's done. Let's go next. Right. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's a, a difficult thing to do, right? If this is your career, it, it's, uh, you go to bed with muscle aches, you go wake up with muscle aches, um, your hands hurt, your back hurts. It's, it's a tough career to be in. And I think sometimes the reward is moving on to something new, different and starting over. Um, it's not it's not an easy industry to uh, to be in, but the way I saw it was you're building people's homes. I mean, it's the ultimate consumer product, right? I spent right. a lot of my career designing consumer products. Like here's one where like this is truly someone's home, and you, there's there's a lot to be said about that. And I I don't think our culture has done a good job of celebrating those individuals that put in those hard days. We tend yeah. to reward, you know, the, our, our influencers and, you know, people on Wall Street for making lots of money. But like this is a very honorable, honorable profession. Yeah, because uh, I think also they also reward um, success like entrepreneurs or people who sit on sit in the offices and build something grand, but not people who actually are on the streets building houses. So I can see where our culture has been taking us. But yeah, so. Yeah, so now that you were very, you're, you consider yourself someone who's very handy, and then you go into this company. This uh, I forgot, as you, you were a uh, construction engineer or something. I forget. No, no, I I, I worked in product design and engineering um, yeah. throughout my career, and I have touched projects that were related to construction, um, doing uh, large scale projects and doing some of the engineering and analysis um, at at a you know ten fifteen years ago. But I always uh, and or I would do product design for like tools, like power tools or, or things like that. But generally, I m most of my career I got I spent getting involved in product design, and then eventually I got into product design that involved matching that product with an app, right? And I, I became very familiar with software development and worked with um, one of my best friends and, and a partner at, a, at my old job where, you know, I was learning sort of the software side of things, which is a different process than, you know, physically engineering something or physically building something. And I just love the idea of like that research and, and MVP approach and, and fast follow and, you know, the agile process. And I, and I really sort of learned to appreciate software development. Got it. And so what do you feel is more challenging, like develop, like use, like basically develop building, like doing actual construction work or actually designing or engineering the product? Ooh, it depends who you ask. I, I would say both are, both are incredibly challenging. I would say construction work because, you know, when you run into a problem in a, in a digital environment, like you're designing something in CAD and you're at your desk and you run into a problem or you see a test result you don't like, you regroup or whatever, you really haven't spent the money yet. That, that major investment hasn't been made. But if you're in construction, you're out in the field and you find out a column is in the wrong spot or there need, like that is a significantly costly improvement. The way construction works is it has a waterfall effect on the schedule. And there's a lot of problem solving in the field. And, and there's a lot of anger from that, right? It's like, who made this mistake? Accountability, you know, you know, people pointing fingers. So I've, in my world, since, you know, granted, I, I have more experience on the design and engineering side of things. I would say the construction is tougher. Yeah, because I think um, there's more at stake when you're actually building it. When it, like when you're an engineer, when you're trying to solve one problem and let's just say there's a mistake in it, uh, that could be rectified pretty quickly. But if you're, you know, let's just say if you, as you mentioned, when you're trying to place a drywall and the drywall is not positioned the right position, is not positioned properly, that kind of leads to the uh, foundation of the house being or a building just you know going in the wrong well, direction 
right? Yeah, let me build off of that. Like, let's say you, you know, the drywall is not in the right spot, right? So the wall wasn't put in the right spot because the wall is not in the right spot. Those custom kitchen cabinets you ordered won't fit, which means the appliances won't fit. And so like all the trades that follow on have to stop or have to move their schedule. And the guy has to come in, you know, one of the laborers has to knock down that wall and put that wall in the right place, put back the sheetrock, put back the spackle, the paint. And again, what did that delay cost you? Several days, several weeks, maybe longer, because now you missed your window of the cabinet installer. Then you missed your window for the appliance install. So everything is connected in a non-parametric way, I'd like to say, right. where it, you know, it will just update itself. <clears throat> and that's something like in an engineering world, in our software that we would use, we would say, oh, it's parametric. So you make one change and the cascading effects will update. That doesn't happen in construction. It's all done manually. And um, yeah, it's it's just a tough industry. Like I, I give those guys a lot of credit for dealing with that. I think is so yeah, let's come but coming to window that the app you're building is it is the purpose of building window meant for those to provide that appreciation for the construction workers and the construction people? Yeah, I think it's appreciation by those like it's built for the people in construction by people in construction, right? My co-founders who really have an appreciation for the guys with great skill, great talent, who have hundreds of pictures on their phone and no place to put them. And, you know, these aren't pictures that belong on Instagram or on TikTok because they're not pretty. They're raw. The people who understand them are the people who work in construction. They're the people who appreciate it. You post those pictures on a platform like Window and you're getting the like. You're getting, we, are, we don't call them likes, we call them digs. So you <laughs> either dig something or you don't. So, you know, um, we give I people a version of the like is a dig it. Um, <laughs> so do you dig it or not. And uh, what we do is, you know, we want to reward those workers for the great work that they're doing. Um, some of the work is very tedious, um, demanding. And what you see is, you know, for those workers that were that are posting, they're posting and they're tagging the projects they're on. That's the, that's a big difference for us is that you know, we're trying to create that journal of the project, of the build, start to finish. So you get to see like a collage of images come together and then there's this finished building. So it's unlike anything that's ever been done before. Yeah, because I think it's very particularly focused on construction workers by construction workers. But in terms of what you're trying to build, are you looking to appeal this to the wider public or is it just only between construction workers and construction workers? Or Well, there's not nothing stopping anybody from signing on and, and taking a look at like the Brooklyn Tower, which is one of our flagship projects on there that we're seeing a lot of people posting to. Um, but generally, it's built for the people in construction. Um, we don't have company accounts yet, but, you know, when we do add the ability for a subcontractor to join, you know, what he'll see is um, the ability to search guys who are available for work and look at their profiles and see their work and see where they worked. Those are two very important points of validation to know if a guy is good, seeing his work and how long has he been working on that project. And if he worked on a major project for a major developer, that's all they need to know. It's, you know, developers and subcontractors have their own brand and construction that they carry with them. Just like in a startup, hell yeah, I'm going to hire a developer from Google or from Apple, right? Like that that alone, like I don't need to, I don't need to talk to them any, any longer, right? So in the construction industry, you work for major developers or major subcontractors, you know, and on, or on these major projects, that's the point of validation. And I'm giving these guys to have a visual uh, resume, right? This okay. is a visual portfolio that doesn't exist. Yeah, because so the mission right now for a window is to be able to provide the window to what's going on in the construct and that what they're doing in the construction the job site. site into the job site. Yeah, but yeah. so where do you feel that? Um, let's say for example, you're are you looking to make this more appealing to commercial buildings, or are you looking to have this available for residential properties like residential constructions as well? Yeah. Right now, our focus is on cities and commercial properties only because um, that's where we see the need is greatest. That's where we see our growth strategy works the best. Um, even monetization uh, is obviously, you know, much more apparent in, in those larger scale projects. And to me, that's the NFL of construction, right? Why not start there? Like I the big start, start the big, yeah, start the big and then expand all the way to every kind of construction out there. 
Yes. And, you know, I, I like to say, you know, you could leave the, uh, the home builders and the house flippers to HDTV, like, you know, um, there is no HDTV for the kind of projects that we have on the window, right? You, yeah. you, you don't understand what it takes to do like, like the kind of concrete that they pour in HDTV is, is like one quarter the strength of the kind of concrete you pour in some of these yeah. buildings. Yeah. No, and there's I'll... a lot of dynamics to it. Like there's a lot of challenges to doing that. So, you know, what we're showing you is, is a whole different level of what's out there. Yeah, because let me explain this, because this is a funny, this, when you brought up HGTV, um, this is interesting, because when I, I actually worked in real estate, like many years ago, and I was, I, wanted, I initially was more inspired by how the flipping process works for houses. And I thought like, okay, maybe HG, HGTV has done a great job in trying to showcase that, okay, it's a, gla it's a glamorous thing to do is to be able to flip houses. And then, oh, I've done it. <laughs> yeah and then when you start when you go into it because i were i was working with an investor who does flip houses and i wanted to flip houses myself but then i realized the amount of work that has to be put in it takes like several months to be able to fully complete that that project yes. and i felt like that was not okay so basically i did, basically I came to the conclusion that hctv lied to me so <laughs> yes so yes. that's kind There's of a lot of uh the things you see on HTTV and, uh, you know, uh, on the weekends, my wife and I may catch an episode here and there and sit and watch it. And I'll say, see the prices that they're giving? That's not what it really costs. See how long they're doing? That's not really going to take that long. And it's like, you know, some some shows do a good job of, of kind of showing you the pain and the delay and the cost. And other shows really kind of pump it up to make it look like it really does happen that fast. And it doesn't, right? And I I know this from you know flipping homes myself. Um, I've done six over you know since my early twenties, and it's challenging. It 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 is you know it it really depends on your relationships with those contractors and subcontractors that you have. And get and today the newest problem and what some other you know I got to give credit to a lot of these new con other construction tech startups that are trying to solve supply chain issues. Right. right supply chain issues didn't used to exist before in construction materials you used to be able to get anything delivered to your site almost within the next day right, right? And now today it's like you'll pay whatever if you could just get it so it doesn't affect your schedule now you're basically not dealing i think a lot of a lot of uh, issues happening right now is with delays in so and basically the arrival of the, of the supplies and and also it's like i think the supply chain crisis does have an effect in a way in terms of all right when will this project get done and how and how much work needs to be done needs in order to fully have that project be fully completed in a way right yeah yeah and you know i think part of what we try to do at window is like yes it is a window into the job site into the workers and their work but i you know i have this this hope that it also builds empathy right to right. see how much it takes to build one of these buildings to build you know what is it you know oh a curtain wall like do you know how many panel like how many miles of panels there are in a curtain wall on some of these skyscrapers yeah. and it takes a long time to set them up and line them up and it's like and it's dangerous work right and um you know people so with that like, always like to talk about the like oh that project's supposed to be done last year it's like yeah well also, they're the, the contractors working with half the crew that he yeah. should have. So, how does the structure work for your app in terms of how you want how how it's being communicated to the users and what's how is it being communicated? I don't mean communicate. Let's just say how is it presented to the users? They're like, is it like like a typical social media app where you have all this uh, inf like posts and everything? Say, hey, here's in this construction that X is happening or Y is happening, and then you get notified, and then people start digging it and all that stuff is that right yeah so it's basically post your pictures or your videos and during while your post it's, it'll geotag your location and, and suggest a project that's either created near you or if you've already added the project to your profile it'll tag that project that you're actively working on within the within the dates that you have in your profile so as soon as you upload the picture it gets it goes into the project page so you not only can follow other workers and uh, but you can follow projects. So if you're following a project that you're not even working on, you're also seeing posts from those workers, right? And so you're doing the same in return. So when you post a picture, let's say you're working at the Brooklyn Tower or you're working at uh, the Freedom Tower and you know on interior work, those pictures are tagged to those projects and other people who don't know you, have no connection to you, 
are following that project and see something cool that you do, they can trace it all the way back to you. So it creates connections of the work that you did, who did it and where it was done. Yeah. So, you know, the vision is walking into a building one day, pulling up the app, looking on the map. And I'll tell you every single person who worked on that building and every contractor that worked, that was contracted in that building. And that is probably the best tool you have, even better than five-star reviews and everything that everybody tries to do to find the right person. Because when you see someone's finished work, you often say, I wonder who did that? Well, I'm going to tell you who did that. Yeah, because I think I have, I want to add on that because I remember when I was in New York, I've come across a lot of buildings out there. And um, the issue is that um, I just I want to know more about this, per, this development firm or more about this contractor who built this or let's just say any any sort of like someone who was there to help out. And I felt like I wanted to um, I, I really wanted to know and I felt like I was just designing something like let's have someone reach let me let me reach out to someone saying who, who can tell me about this person who built it which i couldn't do so i think this you what you're doing right now is very essential uh you're trying to bring that construction world to the forefront to the general public which is good and, i like to say like we're bringing transparency to the construction site right yeah when you walk around new york city you see all these green boards you can go up to like the entrance of one of the boards and you could probably find a poster that tells you what's being built and it's a render and it tells you the developer's name and address and that's it right you can maybe find a website but you know today's day and age we're providing transparency right we're gonna you pull up the app and you and i'll show you the building being built every step of the way got it and All so crowd post. yeah because I want to also want to ask one question. So how is it being monetized? So right now it's 100% free um, for anybody to join. So our monetization plan is actually not going to take place until we, you know, we grow that network and we have enough volume of workers on there, enough volume of available workers that when we add company accounts, we're looking to get those companies to sign on for a very small fee. Um, and help match them with workers that they need that are on the platform. So providing uh, matching tools to workers that are available at a specific time, and also allowing those subcontractors to also attach themselves to those projects. So now there is a more of an advertising aspect for the subcontractor to attach himself to a major project, and he gets to build his visual portfolio in real time, um, crowdsourced by his own employees, Right, without him having to update his own website of everywhere he's worked and the work he's done. So um, that's a huge benefit for them because I think what you'll find is if you talk to many subcontractors, ask them when the last time they updated their website <laughs> with their uh, most recent projects. Right. So this is this becomes a tool for the general contractor, the developer to expand their network of subcontractors. Yeah, and also one last thing I want to ask is I just like I said as I mentioned earlier in the, in the show that you won the pitch and demo event for Silicon Valley and construction tech, what was the way you, what was, what were some ways that the judges were impressed with how you presented it? I think I had a very clear message, right? I, I think what stood out is I had to make it very clear that you don't always, I like to call it, you don't need a technology sledgehammer to solve a construction technology, like a construction problem. And so when I asked people in the audience, how many people here know somebody or is sending their own kids or recommending their own children go to a trade school? And no one raised their hand. Usually I get an audience of like a hundred or more of one of these events and one person will raise their hand that they know is going to a trade school. Here, nobody, right? And you know we don't do a good job in this country of elevating what it means to be in the trades. It's a very rewarding career. You can finish the tr a trade program in less than two years, graduate without any student loans, and make a six-figure salary within a couple of years, and be way ahead of you know someone you graduated high school with who's graduating with six figures of college debt and is making fifty thousand dollars a year. Like when these guys, that's their starting salary, and you won't find these guys working weekends either. Yeah. So I I. I see a lot of these younger individuals entering the trades and being like, 
they're driving new cars, <laughs> you know, <laughs> they're going on vacation and yeah. they're being 20 years old. And it's like, you know, yet we kind of tag that as, oh, he's going to trade school. He's not going to college, right? There is a lot, I would say there's a lot of rewards for these individuals to go into the trades. Um, not just talking about what we talked about earlier, uh, about, you know, you're building someone's home, right? Yeah. You're really doing something meaningful, but also, you know, you're creating quite a career path. And probably one of the best things is for some of these individuals, many of them who are very motivated, go in and become entrepreneurs themselves. Yeah. You know, after 10 years, they have all this experience working under a couple of subcontractors. They open up their own plumbing business or HVAC business. And um, and they're and then they're well into the six figures, if not more. Um, so, you know, why why on earth did we discount that and just keep sending people to college? Uh, and now there's this huge job shortage and now we can't even find these guys. So my focus with the judges has been like, guys, like there's th this problem is just so obvious and it's right in front of us. And I think they understood that. I think they were like, yeah, this this is something we hear. It doesn't matter what state you're in. We hear this problem. All right, cool. So last question, since we're running out of time. So what advice would you give to um, potential founders and even visionaries of the future and what they're trying to build? I would say um, don't go it alone um, and find co-founders who have deep experience in the space you're working in. I have to you know, say that you know what I've learned from my co-founders who run really uh, impressive construction businesses in the New York City area, in the hardest city to build in, the problems that they run into, the, the knowledge that they've imparted uh, into me, and realizing that, like, look, we have to prioritize what we can do on this platform, and we've got to solve the pain points for both the workers and the business owners, because I think, and they also provide a significant amount of uh, direction and support and leadership and um, even design uh, help uh, as far as like, you know, design input into the product. So it's really important for any founder who's getting into a space to partner uh, either as a co-founder, get a, a really good board of advisors together of people of sub with subject matter expertise, because it is going to be really hard to solve those problems and get into the industry without it. All right, cool, Ed. Thank you so much for your time and your appearance on the Next in Time podcast. And we're looking forward to seeing your success. And yeah, looking oh, forward to you, seeing how, how the construction world changes. Thanks for having me, ST. All right, cool. Thank you.